In this special episode of This Week in Linux, we're creating the ultimate episode for the ultimate Linux GNU's podcast. This is episode 42 of This Week in Linux. On this episode, we cover the release of Linux 4.19, the return of Linus Torvalds to the Linux kernel, the big news for IBM to, re- to acquire Red Hat, the status update news for Solus, the latest releases for Firefox, TeamViewer, and Farin OS. We also take a look at some interesting new hardware from System76, Pine64, and more. We haven't had many gaming news topics recently, so we're going to fix that with some awesome new sales for various different Linux games from Fanatical, Humble Bundle, and Steam. Later in the show, we'll talk about some unfortunate security news from the Xorg project, and we'll have a follow-up for the recent Microsoft patent news. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital. And this is your weekly source for Linux GNU's. Up first in the show this week is some pretty big news. IBM is now set to acquire Red Hat. Now, Red Hat is, if you're not aware, is one of the one of the most important projects or companies for the Linux community. They they're they have their hands in tons of things. They, of course, create the Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or RHEL. They also work on CentOS, Fedora, Systemd, and many of the people who work for Red Hat also work for Gnome Pro- uh, Foundation, and they do a lot of things that are you know, very much a part of the Linux community. So this is an interesting thing. I don't know if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, IBM has known for doing some un- uh, questionable uh, things in the past, as far as their decision making, like selling the ThinkPad line to Lenovo, that was winner. That was a weird thing to do, but you know, hopefully, this is a a good thing for both Red Hat and the community. Now, uh, Red Hat's actually been evaluated before at like twenty million dollars worth of a company. Uh, IBM is set to acquire them for thirty four billion dollars. So this is a very interesting thing to see what happens with it, and I don't. As like I said, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I hope it's a good thing because Red Hat is a very important piece of the Linux community. And uh, if they were to, ha- if if IBM were to give some more backing to allow Red Hat to do more things, as well as uh, allow them to, you know, contribute to other pieces of the community, this could even be this could actually be a very very good thing. We'll just have to wait and see to find out more. So. Um, Unfortunately, I also was unable to do this in the live stream, so in the next topic, I might also say up first in the show, feel free to ignore that. Uh, that was because this sh- this uh, news was released the day after the live stream, so I'm doing this as like a, like a follow-up thing to make sure that this is in the episode, because this is some pretty big news, and I want to make sure that this is in this very special episode 42 of This Week in Linux. So if you'd like to learn more about this particular piece of news and this announcement, uh, I'll have a link to the uh, acquisition of Red Hat by IBM article from Reuters in the show notes. Up first in the show this week is Linux 4.19 was released. And this has a lot of uh, improvements to the uh, to the system itself because they every time they make a new release, there's always a ton of new things. Uh, they added Intel cache pseudo-locking. They added a new experimental support for the EROFS file system. And they've also added preliminary support for the Wi-Fi 802.11ax uh, protocol or well, the, uh, the structure for Wi-Fi. But what's a, a side note that's somewhat interesting is that the uh, Wi-Fi consortium, I guess, has decided to rename the protocol instead of saying 802.11 whatever they're just calling it a number so now it's going to be Wi-Fi 6 instead of some random string of numbers and letters i mean it's not necessarily random but it's the the letters are definitely random i don't know what they were there for there was like b there was like b g n a c now a x and like whatever so maybe in the future like with Wi-Fi 7 they'll stop doing the the string of letters and numbers, but we'll see about that. But anyway, back on to the kernel, because that's not really that related. Uh, the kernel also has temporary temperature monitoring support uh, that is more accurate for the AMD Threadripper 2. So that's really cool to see. And speaking of the Linux kernel, Linus ha- Torvalds has returned and is now back in charge of the Linux kernel. So the for a lot of people who were worried that over the you know the code of conduct controversy that Linus was going to 
essentially be kicked out or pushed out or whatever, and that him leaving for like the temporary break was more of a a sign that that was the inevitable. But thankfully, uh, that is they were they were incorrect in that assessment, and that Linus is now returned. And Greg K H wrote in the uh, the release notes that he says, uh, Linus, I'm handing the kernel tree back to you. You can have the joy of dealing with the merge window. So, if you were uh, assuming that Linus wasn't coming back, I'm happy to say that you were incorrect and that he is back. And, uh, well, they're still doing some changes for the committee, like the Code of Conduct Committee and stuff like that. So, there's still things that are going to change around that, but we'll have to wait and see what those are. And in the next uh, following episodes, I will cover it if something interesting changes. And, uh, yeah, if you want to find out more about this and the release notes it's in general, you can find a link in the show notes. Up next in the, in the show is some very big news from the Solus Project. Solus released a blog post uh, today of the recording that for uh, called In Full Sale. And essentially it breaks down, like, it's a very, very interesting blog post because it covers all the things that are happening with the Solus Project, as well as where's Ike, where he, where's he's been, uh, what the communication he's having with the current with the project teams and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of in there, so I'm not going to be able to go through everything because it is a very big blog post. Um, but it also is very detailed, so they give you like the the history of what what parts of the uh, when they talk to them, like they they even give you like some like rough dates and stuff when when the, the last time they talked to him, things like that. So uh, if you want to read the whole thing, I would suggest doing that because it is very useful. There's a lot of information in there. Uh, but the synopsis of it is they have uh, essentially haven't heard from Ike in a little while, and they're moving forward with Solus in their in the direction that they are choosing. Now, they're not saying that Ike's a, a, away from the project or he's out of the project officially or anything like that. They're just saying that they're moving forward to, and you know, until something changes, that's what this is what they're doing. And they're, they've made a lot of really cool um, changes that I think are pretty interesting. But they've also made a lot of, um, you know, given a lot of information about what is what is happening with a lot of different things. So first of all, the the one of, there's a lot of questions that have been been around about where Ike is, but also what's happening with Budgie Eleven, uh, what's going on with the Patreon, who's getting the money, all kinds of stuff like that. So this blog post covers pretty much everything, like probably everything. I mean, I don't know if there's all the questions that ever been that have been asking is is covered in this, but the ones that I know of are covered. So first of all, they covered Budgie Eleven saying that the next version of Budgie or Solus is going to use Budgie ten point five, and then there's going to be another future release of ten point five point one. There might be some more, um, you know, more changes for the the ten series. Uh, in the future, they don't they don't have a guarantee right now, but they did say that the Budgie 11 will not be going to Qt. It will be going to GTK 4. So uh, they're going to be switching. Whenever they do switch to Budgie 11, it'll be a GTK 4 base. They also uh, said mainly the probably the most interest, the most important, most asked question outside of where Ike is is what's happening with the Patreon, and this is a very uh, very important topic that if you are a patron of Solus, you need to like right now stop because they this is a suggestion by the Solus team because the Patreon Solus pro, um, uh, campaign is not controlled by Solus that it's apparently was only going to Ike and they don't know what's going on with the money they don't have access to the money they don't even know how much is in the the Patreon account. So their suggestion is to immediately cease your donations to the so, the Solus uh, Patreon campaign because at this point there's they don't this is not going to Solus and also they're saying that if you uh, d- if you do it immediately then you have time for a couple of days or at least uh, they, I'm not really sure when Patreon is exactly going to charge it but it's re- usually in the beginning of the month so some like November first to the third is usually when Patreon does the um, the charging so their suggestion is to cease it as, as soon as possible that and because otherwise patreon will charge you whether anyone takes the money out of patreon or not patreon will charge you so the money could just be in limbo and no idea where it's going like because like, patreon kind of works as like a like an escrow account sort of where they take the money and they just leave it until you withdraw it you're like the 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 uh, campaign controlled person um, they could just 
not withdraw it, but the money's still being charged. So be sure to uh, make sure that your uh, Patreon is canceled. But they did say that if you would be, you know, when you do cancel it, be sure to contact Patreon. Let them know the reason you're canceling is because they don't have control of the pro of the money. The project them, that you're trying to donate to doesn't have control. So maybe, uh, hopefully, if you if enough people who were patrons were to leave it and then let Patreon know why they're leaving it and letting them know that they're, you know, they need to get access to it. Maybe it will convince Patreon to provide them access. I don't know. Uh, that's really what the suggestion is currently. Cease the current uh, Patreon donations and also to let Patreon know that, that this is why you're leaving and uh, hopefully they'll fix it. They have said that they are pre preparing to submit a formal application for Solus to join the Software Freedom Conservancy, which will be a basically like a parent organization for Solus so that you could donate to the Conservancy and then they will be able to send the money to Solus. So that the the legal aspects, the organizational structure that S the SFC could provide would help Solus kind of handle all that stuff, rather rather than going through Patreon and things like that. So if you are interested in, in becoming and being a donator or a patron to Solus, there is still there is going to be something to do, just not right now. Next up is another Solus thing because there is there has to be at least one topic in the show that is plasma-based, right? So Solus announced the plasma testing ISO. And Solus announced it in the Roundup 11 blog post. This has, uh, you can use Plasma 5.14 and the uh, application, the KDE applications section of 8 to 18.8.2, uh, 08.2. And you can, be, you can use um, all the great things that are coming in, the latest version of Plasma inside the uh, Solus structure. So if you're interested in trying out Solus, but you haven't done so because you're a Plasma user, um, this is a great opportunity to do that because this is certainly in testing. So don't, uh, it wouldn't be like a production ready or anything like that, but it is something to check out if you're interested in that. So I'll have a link to both these, the in full cell blog post, as well as the testing ISO blog post for the Solus Plasma edition. Before we move on from the uh, Solus topic, I wanted to briefly retouch on something about the Patreon thing. I forgot to mention that the Patreon issue is not, Patreon is not giving control to this project. In Patreon's defense, which normally I wouldn't, you know, care about defending, the, you know, any kind of uh, financial institution, but uh, in Patreon's defense, the reason why they're not doing it is because this is a completely separate project separate people trying to take over the control of another campaign. So, for example, if someone was going to try to join, take over Tux Digital's campaign, I would expect Patreon to ignore them and not let them do that. So I understand their position of they don't know, they, they don't have any you know, evidence or legal legal evidence to take over the project so it, or the campaign, so it might be something that Patreon is just in a situation where they can't do it. So it's not to say that the Patreon itself is doing anything wrong. It's just the only person who had control over the Patreon campaign for Solus is Ike. And because Ike is kind of MIA at the moment, it's really they Patreon can't really do anything about it. So that's kind of the issue. So it's I, I just wanted to clarify that it's not like Patreon is holding anything hostage. It's just tr trying to take over their control from one people to another makes it a little bit more more difficult. So just wanted to clarify that. Next up in the show is Firefox 63 has been released, and Firefox comes with many major improvements to web extensions. the The biggest one mainly is that they have a improved. They've set it up where web extensions have their own process, so um, you can now like your each tab will have its own process, but also each extension is having its own process. So that way, there's, there's a bunch bigger security uh, implementation between you know extensions can't talk to each other without permission by the user. And some cases they can't talk to each other at all based on the infrastructure of the of the the, set, the setup really. So other things that they did was they added some content blocking features. So they had a, they added a lot of different uh, new settings that offer users a greater control over their browser and over what is allowed to track them or not. So you can also choose to block third party tracking cookies by default or block all tracking cookies or and you know, create 
exceptions for like a whitelist if you did want to have like a trusted sites that you are okay with them tracking you but you don't want the majority of people's people to track you like you could do that as well they've also fixed a lot of bugs and some things with the there was an issue that made it where when you try to do auto filling bookmarks the urls wouldn't work in some cases so they've corrected that and they've done a lot of improvements for the the, the uh, performance and the stability of the browser so a lot of great things mainly though the biggest thing is definitely the web extensions having their own processes that makes it a lot more secure and things like that but they've also done a lot of this stuff with the whole uh, tracking cookie stuff so if you go into your settings by default there's a little bit of tracking blocked but not really that much so you just go into your settings and you can choose like the privacy and security section of this preferences and you can choose there how much is being tracked and how and what you want to allow and what you don't and uh, there's a lot of different options so you just be able to you know just go through those and see what you want to use um, the tracking third-party cookies is a really good thing because it means that uh, people who are tracking you through uh, for example let's say Facebook is one that people do so let's say someone decides to put a Facebook like button on their website and on that um, on that on that page the button is actually tracking you for Facebook so that is a third-party cookie the tracking inside of that button is a cookie a third-party cookie so that would be blocked so in that case um, you could have just third-party third-party cookies blocked and it would block that but if you were to have an, like if the website were to have analytical data tracking uh, on their website itself that wouldn't be tracked so you would be able to allow the main the, the main website to uh, collect some data information about how you're using their site and things like that but not being tracked by you know some random third party like Facebook would be trying so anyway if you want to find out more about this for Firefox 63 you can find link in the show notes next up in the show is team viewer 14 preview is now available it comes with an updated interface and better performance. If you're not aware, uh, TeamViewer is a desktop, remote desktop sharing application. It allows you to control the uh, computer of another person from anywhere in the world, really. And, uh, they, and, of course, they have to give you permission to do so. But it's a nice, easy way to do it because there's a lot of ways to do this type of thing. But this is one of the easiest ways. Someone just gives you an ID number and a passcode. And that's it. And the, those the passcode and the ID number are automatically generated for that user, so they don't have to create anything or any accounts or whatever. So the, the TeamViewer is a really easy to use for both the administrative side and the uh, receiving help side. And um, it is nice because it's been on uh, Linux for a very long time. But what's really cool about this list version and the previous version is that they're no longer using wine as a as a as a base to make the system work team viewer is now a native application for linux so there's no wine wrapper anymore so that is fantastic now there's also something they're introducing this particular release release called team viewer pilot and it allows remote assistance for on-site staff or clients using augmented reality yeah i don't know why they called it that that's a weird way of saying it but it's not really augmented reality because AR refers to like things that are happening in your visual view that you can like overlay digital effects on top of what this is kind of is saying you are able to draw things on the screen or highlight objects that you can see um, I'm not really sure how they're doing it they say it's you can say objects in the real world I don't know because it's like, how would they see that unless you have like a camera that's pointing to uh, something in the room? You still need kind of like that. So it's it's something separate from what they usually do for the team viewer. So anyway, it's an interesting concept, and I want to see how like well how well this works. But um, I don't know if it's really augmented reality or not. But we'll see. Uh, they are saying that you they are working to make team viewer work in Wayland, which is pretty cool. Uh, they're they're making it so that if you use Wayland, you can provide tech support to other people. They currently don't have a, a way to do uh, the support to inside of a system that is using Wayland. 
but you can provide service uh, support if you wanted to. So that's a, you know, they are still working on making full support for Wayland, but it's really nice to see that they already have this kind of work done so far. So anyway, if you'd like to learn more about TeamViewer 14, you can find a link in the show notes. Oh, really quick. TeamViewer 14 is a free-to-use tool if you're doing it for non-commercial purposes. If you're doing it for commercial purposes, it's like $50 a month or something uh, per session or per user, like per support person, uh, things like that, um, which is actually kind of better. than they, they used to charge like $800 for the piece of software, so it is slightly cheaper, not by much, but still, you can do it on a monthly basis, I guess that makes it better. Anyway, show notes. Up next in the show is Farron OS 2018.10 has been released, and this is a new snapshot that is, uh, you know, fittingly named October snapshot. And while most of the work in the snapshot w was done on the back end, there are some interesting changes that are, you know, to a visual aspects. So one of the things they did is they, well, Farron has been around for a while doing um, modifications to like a cinnamon based mint. Um, approach and they have like custom themes and things like that and they did a really good job for the theming and the uh, the customization for the mint cinnamon edition they've decided to change away from that though and that they're now doing a Ubuntu 1810 base and they're using a uh, they're using KDE plasma instead of cinnamon so what's interesting is how they're they're building a it's, it's currently in the beta uh, beta phase right now, but um, it's it's interesting because they're doing a a version from upgrading from the previous Mint LTS edition of Farron. You can now upgrade to the using the Ma Manage Base Update channel. You can now upgrade to the new eighteen Ubuntu eighteen ten version of the Farron system. So that is an interesting approach. Uh, there's you know, I'm not really sure how that's gonna, how well that will work, but I'm curious to try it out just for the sake of it. Um, there's also a lot of things that have been made to the Farron theme tweaks because they're now uh, making it work with the uh, Breeze theme because they're using Plasma again. And there's a lot of new stuff with like, um, you know, improved uh, wallpapers and stuff like that, like and just to switch it over to the the new layout. So the the thing, the most interesting thing is the main agenda for the future outline of the release notes. And it discusses the goal for Farron OS experience to other desktop environments. So one of the new desktop environments is like the, the KDE Plasma version is like in a experimental phase. So we're not really sure if they're going to completely transition away from their existing uh, setup or do it together uh, or like be doing both at the same time. But it does say it will be interesting to see what happens whenever you know, like in the future, when we find out what more about this. But it's really the the fact that they're doing this this ability to upgrade between the two is a really interesting approach. So I am looking forward to seeing what happens with this. And if you would like to find out more for yourself, you can check a link in the show notes for Farron OS twenty eighteen point ten. Up next in the show is some unfortunate news, but not super terrible. Just definitely not good though. And that is, there has been a security advisor from the Xorg uh, project, and they found a pretty bad problem. Essentially, it allows for a uh, root escalation, so you could escalate your privilege to be able to have complete pseudo rights and stuff, and to execute commands and stuff like that. However, uh, this is only available for people who have like physical access to your system or if they already had remote access in the first place. It's not a remote exploit, so that's not a problem. But once you do have access, you could elevate your privileges with this um, this function. And this is actually kind of a small function to do, but uh, overall it's not horrible, but it isn't good either. So with the, with the correct command line parameters, you could um, validate an, X, an Xwork server. You can, le you can get um, privileged revelations will be able to uh, arbitrarily overwrite files and things like that. So you could um, use, the, use the log file argument or the TAC arg log file argument, and it could overwrite arbitrary files in a file system due to incorrect checks in the parsing of the option. So this has been a, a this actually, has been sent, uh, it was introduced, it was found recently, but it was introduced in 1.19.0, uh, 
it was a regression in about two years ago. So uh, this this issue has been around for about two years. Um, there is going to be a patch working on it. I don't know if it's actually been patched yet, but I know that they have issued a, a recommendation of how you can mitigate this. So it's not an attack vector. Um, so it's not that huge of a problem that needs to be uh, fixed right now. Uh, you know, it's so it's not. I mean, it does need to be fixed as soon as possible, of course. But it's not like um, it's not a remote attack vector, so it's not. They would already have to be in your system. But e anyway, it still needs to be corrected as soon as possible. But there are mitigations that you can work around it, and um, they also say that they recommends the use of a display manager that to start X sessions, which does not require XOR to be installed as a set UID, so that if it if it's if it's not installed as set UID this exploit can't work. So there are many mitigation methods or workaround methods to make this not an issue. But if you are using a system that is using the X in this in the way that is affected, you should definitely uh, look into that. Um, it's hard to say exactly which distributions or whatever is affected because they haven't really given a list out yet. But uh, if, they, if they do, I will include that in the show notes or in a future episode. But for now, if you'd like to learn more about the security advisory, you can go to X, the Xorg link in the show notes. Up next in the show is Thaleo, the open source desktop project from System76. System76 shared some more details about this particular, we talked about it earlier in another previous episode, and uh, you can check out more there from if you would like to. Uh, they have like this interesting animated video campaign for marketing of it. Uh, you could check that out if you like to. But this is essentially a um, an open source desktop computer that you can purchase from System76, and they've recently given some more information about how much um, like the different plans of the systems can be, like for the motherboard and the like the a little bit of the specs, not completely a lot of the specs, but a little bit. So, for example. They've set up where they're doing this thing called, there's the motherboard, and they're now they're doing a daughter board. So they're essentially taking the proprietary aspects of a typical motherboard and putting it into a separate board that, like, some of these SATA connections would be put on the data, the daughter board, and the daughter board would be, like, connected through PCI, so not actually SATA. So, like, there's there's a lot of... It's an interesting approach, so it allows them to have the main system be open source while still having proprietary aspects on the secondary board. So that's an interesting approach, and I am very curious to see how well that works out. But they've also said that they will be opening the pre-orders on Thursday, November 1st, so uh, as of this release of this episode, later this week. So if you'd like to look into that, you can. They said that there's going to be three different tiers and that will be um, the Thaleo. Uh, the Thaleo regular will have up to 32 gigs of RAM available. You could order the Thaleo major, which has 128 gigs of RAM. Uh, also, there's a storage of uh, 24 terabytes for Thaleo. The major has 46 terabytes. This is an insane amount of storage. Uh, and it gets even crazier with the Thaleo massive up to 768 gigabytes of ECC RAM and 86 terabytes of storage. This would be a beast. So I'm curious what the processor would be in, the, in like the GPU they would be using in this. They haven't given that information out yet, but it sounds like it. whatever their, their choices is going to be massive. I assume there's going to be at least one option with a Threadripper. Um, otherwise, you know, what else could they pick? Anyway... Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about the Thaleo, you can find a link to that in the show notes. Up next in the show is Pine64, the creators of the Pine64 boards and the Pine60 or the Pine Book, um, is also looking into planning. Well, they they're already planning it. Uh, they haven't got any full details of what this is going to be or what their overall plan is in general. But they have said that they are planning uh, to release a budget-friendly smartphone. So. This is a potentially a fantastic, um, a fantastic idea because it's a Linux-powered KDE Plasma, or more specifically Plasma Mobile uh, implementation of uh, 
of using a budget phone like for a full Linux phone, but, but very cheaply, roughly around like a hundred dollars, because the uh, the Pine Book is about a hundred dollars, and all of their other products are less than a hundred dollars. So they probably are going to stick to that frailed that range, but they might they might be a little bit more. I think that if they were doing a budget phone for like they could get to two fifty and still be considered a budget phone, and it'd be a, a hopefully it'd be a good quality thing. They said that they are targeting. Um, two gigs of RAM and 16 gigabytes of storage. And if they can do a phone at that high of a, you know, two gigs of RAM and 16 gigs of storage, that's pretty high for a hundred dollars. Like the, a couple years ago, the um, Nexus five was only like 1.5 gigs, I think. So it might've been two. Uh, but anyway, the, the fact that they'd be able to do that would be really interesting. And they've also said that they're uh, planning to potentially make a, uh, a pine tablet thing as well. So uh, they haven't really said a, like a lot of details, but they are looking into it and they have said that, that you can sign up for dev kits. So if you were a developer and you would like to have give access to the development kit to create software for the pine phone, there'll be a link in the show notes to their, uh, some more information about this. Uh, unfortunately they haven't really given exact methods yet, but maybe in the future they will so I'll link to their website as well as the contact information and things like that um, before so at least there will be some way to get in touch with them if you are interested in doing it doing development for them so if you would like to get to read some more about this I'll have a link to an article talking about this uh, this news in the show notes below up next in the show is probably something I can't pronounce correctly uh, it's a French term I'm pretty sure and I think it's pronounced la frite I could be wrong probably am wrong it is a Libra Arm SBC, so it's a small a board. It's a it's a board like a Raspberry Pi, and it's a fairly fairly cheap uh, board for only five dollars. Now they also have a more beefier version for ten dollars that has uh, the the lower end version has the five twelve RAM, and the uh, bigger version has a one gig RAM. So if you wanted to try that. It's uh, pretty cheap and still pretty powerful for what it is. Now, they say that it's competing squarely against the Raspberry Pi Zero. And they also, I'm not sure if they claim it or benchmarks are claiming it, but there are some claims that this board is 10 times faster than the Raspberry Pi Zero. Which is not that surprising because the Raspberry Pi Zero is not meant for like super powerful. It's meant for um, being really small and portable. So like this board is much bigger than the Raspberry Pi Zero, but also a little smaller than the Raspberry Pi regular. What's really cool about this is it's very cheap, five to ten dollars, and it has support for regular full size HDMI, an Ethernet port, uh, two USB ports. And also a GPIO, a GPIO header arrangement that's very similar to the Pi. So it has a lot of potential to be a very cheap but still very useful board because it has all the, the necessary stuff with like the, the processor built onto it. So it's a, it's a, it's kind of like the Raspberry Pi where it's a computer rather than just like an Arduino where you have to like specifically tell it what like programming that board to do what you want it to do, like special purpose. This is more of a like a, Full serp, full system in like a small, small form factor. So anyway, if you would like to find out more about this particular thing, they have a Kickstarter that is currently uh, available to back. They have already met their uh, back their rec- their goal by a ton. I think they're going for ten thousand, and they've already gone over fifty thousand. So they've uh, they're good to go. But what's really interesting about it is that most Kickstarters, when they start like a hardware project. They do a thing where it's like, "Hey, this is where we're, this is what we're gonna do, and then you give us money, and then we'll make it in like next year or something." However, in this case, they're essentially starting the shipping as soon as the Kickstarter is over because the estimated delivery time is November of 2018, and the campaign ends in November 2018. So. That's pretty interesting. So if you are wanting to look into it, you could probably get it pretty quickly in terms of like, uh, just in general of a Kickstarter program. So if you are looking for it, I'll have a link to this in the show notes. Up next in the show is PPSSPP. So this is a PSP project for uh, PSP emulation. So you can play PSP games on your computer. We've talked about this particular project before in a previous episode. 
but there has been a lot of interesting updates for the latest version. The new, the newest version is 1.7, and this version focuses on stability and bug, fix, bug fixes for the most part. But there are a couple things that are really cool that they've added that are, you know, very interesting. So they've made it where the the games uh, they've boosted the performance and the speed for games. They've uh, done some debugging on the APIs. They've uh, improved optimizations for texture decodings and stuff like that. They've also set up some Discord integration, which is pretty cool. So that allows you to talk to people you're playing with. I guess like, and I'm not really sure how Discord totally integrates in the system because I haven't tried it out myself yet because it was just recently released. But I totally am uh, interested in checking it out because I want to see how they've integrated Discord into the emulator um, because that sounds pretty cool. So if you're interested in PSP emulation, you can check a link in the show notes. Up next in the show is some more gaming news for Fanatical Scream Sale. The Fanatical Scream Sale is a sale where they already have a lot of games on sale right now. Uh, but if you use the, the code SCREAM666, you get 6.66% off of the additional uh, discount to the, the current existing sale. So this is a really cool thing because they already have about like uh, anywhere between 60 to 80% off of these of these games, uh, including like Bioshock and Borderlands and stuff like that and uh, Dying Light and stuff. So you can get a lot of these games and also get an additional discount with that coupon code. Now, there's a link in the description for the show and the show notes. There, This link is an affiliate link because uh, Tux Digital is an affiliate of Fanatical. Uh, but also... The reason why there's a link, it's an additional to the affiliate link. That link is also a uh, quick access to the filtering of Linux games. So if you go to Fanatical, when you, there's no section to say, I only want to want li- look at Linux games. And there is a search section where you can go through this like multi-step process to finally see all the Linux games. Or you can go to tuxdigital.com slash fanatical cell and fanatical cell. I'm saying fanatical. I am saying fanatical. Oh, fanatical. There we go. And that URL will take you directly to fanatical's um, search results that only that shows things that are on sale and only Linux related. So it makes it a lot easier to check this out if you are interested. So just a reminder, this will be an affiliate link as well as an additional uh, benefit for like organizing the stuff for just Linux. So you can go there and check that out. They'll have a link in the show notes. Also this week in Linux Gaming, Humble Bundle has a couple bundles out that uh, you might be interested in, uh, some, especially one that's got some really cool games in it. So uh, first up, we're going to talk about some indie games with Day of the Devs, which is a, a funny term for like a Halloween Day of the Dead reference. I like that. Uh, they have uh, Full Throttle Remastered, Hotline Miami 2, Minute, and Hyper Light Drifter, which are all Linux-based games. Uh, there are some other games in there that are just Windows or Windows Mac or something like that. Um, but if you would like to check out any of those, you know, I have a link to that particular bundle in the show notes as well as in the video description. And there's also going to be a WB Games or the WB Classics Games bundle. And there's a quite a few games in here, but most of them are not Linux-based. Uh, there's some like Batman games and stuff like that, like Arkham Knight or something. Um I don't care because it doesn't run Linux, but there are three games in that bundle that are running on Linux, and they are quite good. All three of them are worth playing, so if you wanted to check out any of them, the bundle would probably be a good option for that. And those three games are Mad Max, Bastion, and Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. And this is the Game of the Year edition, so we get some extra bonus features and stuff like that. So if you are interested in checking out any of those games, the Humble Bundle uh, WB Classics Bundle would be uh, a good option for that. So uh, also to be clear, the link in the the video description and the show notes for this particular, uh, these bundles are affiliate links, just like the Fanatical Cell also has affiliate links. This will help Tux Digital if you were to purchase the games through the link. And so I would appreciate that if you were to do so. Anyway, um, I think the... uh, Bat- the Mad Max and the ba- and the the Bastion Middle Earth are definitely worth checking out. So uh, feel free to look at those in the show notes. Finally, in the gaming section of the show, the there's a big Steam sale coming up. They have like every every year they have multiple Steam sales that are like really big, like Steam wide or not really all Steam, but a lot of games participate. But anyway, uh, thanks to our friends at GamingOnLinux.com, they have published the sale the l- leaked although. 
they're saying that it's been linked, you know, all, like, it happens all the time. So it's not really a leak. Um, they said that it's been leaked anyway, but they'll have the list for it. So if you would like to wait a little while, you can get these, um, these games on sale. Now, the reason why they have these different, like they, these sales are, you know, in different periods of time that are usually about a month apart from each other. And these, they, they're not, they're usually different games that are on sale in each period. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to get a game in Halloween, for example, so the Halloween sale starts technically of releasing of this episode, October 29th or today, um, as it goes on till November 1st. Then there's the autumn sale, which is November 21st through November 27th. Now, then, the, then after that, there's the winter sale for December 20th through no, January 3rd of 2019. Now, most of the time, these games that are on sale will pick one of these periods and not all three. There are some that do all three, but there are a lot of games that just pick one of them and just deal with that. So if there's a game that you wanted that is not in the current sale that, that is happening... Uh, you might want to wait a little bit to see if you know if you're patient. If you're a patient gamer, you might want to wait a little bit to see if there's a better deal down the road. And uh, like it's possible there probably would be. But anyway, if you'd like to check it out, you'll we'll find a link in the show notes. Now, to be clear, this one is not an affiliate link because, well, Steam doesn't do that. If they did, I would have one, but they don't do that. However, I have decided to create an easy way to get to Steam the steam sale really easily the same thing happens with fanatical that happens with steam they have a ton of games in their platform and it's kind of complicated to get to only games that are on sale and only games that are linux so i created tuxdigital.com slash steam sale and that goes directly to steam search results that are for games that are based on that using they're running on linux and also on sale so if you'd like to check that out feel free to do so um, I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well, but that one is definitely not an affiliate link. Uh, if you also want to find out more, uh, I have a consistent uh, link for games if you're on sale. If you want to go to tuxdigital.com slash games on sale, it will give you a list of all the different uh, markets that will have games on sale, and then you can go directly to those links, and it will uh, show you what is like the latest deals for these whatever particular game that the platform is doing. So that could be useful for you as well if you're interested. So I'll have a link to all of these links, including the affiliate links for Fanatical and Humble Bundle, in the show notes and the video description. Up next in the show is a follow-up on the previous topic about Microsoft's patents for the Open Invention Network. There has been some information that has been provided. Now, in some cases, this is not totally confirmed, but there are some statements from the CEO of the OIN, or at least I'm not sure if he's the CEO. I'm pretty sure he is. I think he is. But we'll, we'll, anyway, we'll get to it. So if you're not aware, Microsoft recently joined the OIN and did a partnership to become a member so that their patents will now be beneficial to open source projects. Now this means that if you were to use something that is... Um, essentially given control by the government to Microsoft via patents that you wouldn't have to worry about lawsuits because being a part of this network, which by the way is free to join if you wanted to, even as a developer, you, you can be an individual and join, you don't have to be a company, and you will basically get protection from these patents because Microsoft has also joined. Now, there are still some questions around it, but if we have get, got some information that is, uh, you know, nicer in the sense of what they're, what this all means, what this all is like going to be. One of the questions was, um, so one of the questions was, what, uh, what are all the the patents that are being issued? Now, essentially, Microsoft joined the OIN because the OIN is focused for Linux platform. Now, it means anything that relates to Linux or the Linux kernel or Linux in general because they have a specific definition of what they mean by Linux platform. So you can check that out if you'd like to. But the essentially means if it works with Linux in some way, it should be protected if they're a, part, if they're a member of this network. Now, in this, in this particular piece, there's an interesting question about XFAT, which is a file system for, like, um, you know, USB drives and stuff like the uh, thumb drives and flash drives, stuff like that. So there's 
really no guarantee right now, but the uh, the head of the OIN said that he thinks that it's like 99.9% likelihood that it is protected by this membership. But they haven't specifically confirmed that it is. But based on other things that are related to XFAT, it would probably most likely be protected by this uh, membership with Microsoft. So that's somewhat interesting because they're saying that, that anything that relates to Linux at all that Microsoft has some patents for uh, would be would be covered. So that's nice. But, you know, it's still kind of interesting because the OIN has this, um, I think there's a 30-day, I could be wrong, but I think there's a 30-day uh, period where you can leave the membership. And it's really hard for a project to develop code based on something and then change that easily. So let's say a project were to use something that was covered in these patents because they had their protection and then Microsoft decides to leave, then that protection will be removed completely. And it's kind of, you know, risky to do that. I don't know. Like maybe that's just me uh, being over uh, over cautious about it. I don't know. But overall, I do think that this is a good thing that Microsoft is doing because it does a sh it does show what they're that they're trying to, you know, turn over a new leaf type thing. They're trying to be beneficial to, to developers and trying to be helpful to open source and stuff like that. So uh, Satya Nadella says, uh, for people based on this this question, judge us by the actions we have taken in the recent past, our actions today, and in the future. And that's referring to like, should you trust Microsoft or not? Now, I do think that Microsoft is on the on the path to being trusted, but they're not yet right now because the fact that they still have so many things that are uh, contrary to open source and contrary to the philosophy that makes the community work in the way it does, um, it's really hard for me to you know pat them on the back or whatever and say good job. But it's like, hey, you know, nice try. At least you're trying. And I look forward to eventually saying welcome to the team. But right now, you're just kind of watching on the sidelines and, you know, th uh, handing a cup of water to people while they're working. So I guess that's something. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So when I said that we were moving on, we were just moving on to the next topic, not away from Microsoft, because there's still something about Microsoft. And also to say that, you know, a lot of people are against Microsoft because Windows is doing all the telemetry and keeping data tracking and all this other stuff. So the fact that on one hand they're being nice and on the other hand they're slapping you in the face, they're just, you know, pick and choose which side you're on, I guess. But in my opinion, Microsoft has are still doing things that are contrary to the open source philosophy. So in that sense, I'm still not on your side but I'm willing to listen, I guess. Unfortunately for them, October has been a very, very bad month for Windows 10. And in fact, it's been scary for many users. So the best Windows 10 ever, as they've described it, has uh, have a lot of problems. One of which, which is probably the biggest one earlier in the month, I decided not to cover it because I just assumed there would be even worse things that are happening. And yes, there is. And the worst things, but we'll first, we'll get to that in a second. But the first thing that they did was uh, they did an update that destroyed people's data and made them lose files and, you know, gigs and gigs of files. So that's not good for them. You know, it would not do that. Linux, Linux wouldn't do that to you. Anyway, so the next uh, stuff that happened is that they've now decided to not release any new fixes yet. They're saying that if the data, you know, the data is destroying bug wasn't bad enough the November's almost here and there's no new release that has been uh, sent out that's not having bugs you know like pretty bad bugs for example one of the bugs that they found was uh, zip files were no longer working you couldn't extract them or anything driver issues causing blue screen of death with certain types of components which is kind of funny because you know it, Windows was always talking about the whole blue screen of death is gone and that's never happening again because we fixed all these. Yeah, it's yeah, sure. Uh, they've also broken a lot of fonts on the system. They've had they've set up wrong audio drivers for certain Intel products. Uh, the display brightness settings are completely messed up. 
like all kinds of stuff that are happening uh, that, you know, there's some speculations that's saying that these increase in bugs and failures is due to Microsoft's more attention to the telemetry data and collecting as much as they can about their users rather than actually making a system that doesn't crash and break stuff. Now, even if they weren't doing the telemetry stuff, their system still, you know, has always crashed and broke stuff. That's just, that's the Windows way. Um, but uh, now that they're doing the telemetry stuff, yeah, it's way worse. So they got both sides of, of terrible. Um, so I don't know how to describe it. Other, and In a way, you could say that this should be one of the biggest reasons for people to leave Windows. Now, wh I would say telemetry data by itself is enough to, like, forcing you to accept they're going to steal your information and take all your data, that what, how you use your computer, what applications you use, all this other stuff. That in itself is a reason to leave Windows. The system not working is also a reason to leave Windows. Both of them is a fantastic reason to leave Windows. So, this week in Linux is covering this particular topic because hopefully it will be this week people leave Windows. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. We also have ways to contribute without any cost to you. You can use our affiliate links, and you can find these links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. If you'd like to submit some good news to be featured on the show, then visit our subreddit by going to thisweekinlinux.reddit.com. If you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux, as I'm a co-host of that show. Zeb is back from holiday in the next episode, and we were joined by a special guest, so be sure to check it out. And just a reminder, this show is live every Saturday, usually, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux canoes each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.